Welcome to the Portage County Safety Council podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's safety chat. Hi, it's Mike with the Portage County Safety Council. I'm here with Dr. Kristen Dickerson. Welcome, doctor. Hi, how are you? Good. So you just did this awesome webinar for us yesterday on COVID-19, unmasking the novel pathogen. I love the title, by the way. So, but before we get it, we're going to talk about that and recap your presentation. But before we get into that, for our members that have not had the opportunity to watch that yet, can you just tell them a little bit about yourself and what you do for the Ohio BWC? Absolutely. As mentioned before, my name is Kristen Dickerson. I currently serve as the statewide manager for health, wellness, and special programs at BWC. That includes Better You Better Ohio and all total worker health initiatives that we have. On top of that, I do teach part-time uh, epidemiology and biostatistics for Chamberlain School of Nursing, and I have served as both an infection preventionist in hospitals and infectious disease epidemiologist for counties in southeastern Ohio. So to re-summarize all that, you're way overqualified and you have way too many initials <laughs> after your name. I was going to joke yesterday in a webinar, yeah, but I, I don't want to take up too much time. Can I borrow a few of those and put them after my last yeah, name sure, and give me a little have, pay raise? Yes, that, yes. That works for me. So um, you're probably tired of talking about it, but we have to talk about it because the whole world's coming to an end because of COVID-19, right? So I know. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're like in a dystopian movie where zombies are the next thing. We had killer hornets and COVID and who knows what. And we'll see what happens after the election, right? So um, yeah, the first yeah. <laughs> thing you said, you said a couple of things that I thought were really cool that I, I don't really hear out there very much. Even if I have heard it in a couple small pieces, I really want to focus on. And the first thing that I want to talk to you about is the amount of exposure. So someone that may be in the passing by, you may not be exposed to very much, but, but someone in your home, you may have a higher degree of exposure. And that may affect, you said that according to recent studies, correct? That that may have a, a bigger effect on the level of severity that you have if you're unfortunately diagnosed with COVID-19. Yes, correct. There's actually a lot of studies right now that suggest the amount of virus, the amount of the COVID-19 particles that you're subjected to the amount that you come in contact with can either make you asymptomatic, not have very much of a disease if, if you come across just a few particles, whereas if you're highly exposed and somebody basically just coughs right in your face that has it or you spend a lot of time next to somebody that has COVID-19, the chances are you're going to have a more severe case of the disease and somebody that is not as exposed to those virus particles. So if you just walk randomly past somebody just outside, the chance of you getting a real severe case of COVID-19 is highly unlikely. That's kind of why they're cracking down on bars right now and different things, right? Where people probably after a few drinks and, and a certain time at night, you know, as the evening goes on, probably get a little closer. You know, they do the yeah. hokey pokey, yeah. whatever the kids do at the club right <laughs> yeah. now. I'm sure, it's a little more yeah. aggressive yeah. than that. But that's one of the reasons why they're doing yeah. it is because like, hey, OK, it's different. And people are saying, well, if I'm a Walmart, why can't I go to a bar? Why can't I do this? Well, that's the difference is at Walmart, you're not bumping and grinding at other customers, hopefully, right? No. Unless you're married to and them and coming with them. <laughs> Yes. So when we talk about going to Walmart, everybody goes to Walmart. But when we're at Walmart, our risk of being next to somebody that has COVID and coughing on us for an extended period of time is a lot less than if we go to a bar. Because when we go into Walmart, we're walking around, we don't stand in one area, and we're not really talking to strangers or standing next to them. When you go to a bar, the more you drink, the more you lose inhibition, the more random people you end right. up talking to sometimes. But that all feeds into, like, you're spending more time and um, you're in closer contact with people that you don't come in contact with every day. Also, when we're at a bar, most of the time we're probably drinking or partaking in food or beverages. And so you're not wearing masks and you're sitting, like, right next to people. So that's, that's why the regulations to start closing down bars early have been put into place. Right. So I think this is real crucial, not the bar thing. I just threw that out there for fun, but the amount of exposure is, is real important because that really helps me with masks because going through safety training for so many years, the N95, the respirator training, you got to shave your beard if you're a guy and go through there and get everything fit tested. The first time I heard mask, I was like, well, you're not even getting fit tested. So it's not even, you know what I mean? And I don't agree with that now, but that was my initial reaction. But now I see any kind of layer any kind of thing of washing a hand sanitizer, it's not about perfection. It's about reducing the amount that you're exposed to. Before this beginning, I thought, if I got one COVID particle, I'm a goner. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. But it's really, yeah, yeah. it doesn't really work like that, does it? 
No, and I will tell you that there are viruses that are like that, where if you get one little sore particle, you can't can count yourself unlucky and on the toilet for the rest of the weekend. Oh, no. Norovirus that caught, yes, that norovirus that everybody that causes the stomach flu and you have it for 24 hours and you don't want to leave the bathroom. That's one of those viruses where any contact that you have with it, you're going to get sick. But with COVID-19, it's not like that. There was a factory where two people tested positive for COVID and everybody wore masks and other people within that factory, they tested positive, but they were completely asymptomatic and they didn't, or they had a very, very mild case with just a headache for two days of COVID. And the reason that researchers are saying that is because everybody had the mask on. And while masks are never perfect and PPE is never perfect, it is something. There is a layer there that is stopping people's spit and their respiratory droplets from getting into you. And it really works at reducing your respiratory droplets from getting out from your mouth and your nose and breaking down and making other people sick. Yeah, it, it, we'll get into mask later, but I had a situation in the beginning when I first put the mask on. I didn't want to do it. I was hot, huffy, and I was like, this is dumb, And the, <laughs> but this is right, and I'm having these conflicting thoughts in my, you know, just being honest with you. And then I had this huge sneeze, and this sneeze, it blew out of the sides of the mask. And I was like, see, I told you these things are dumb. That was kind of my niche, you know what I mean? But then I started thinking about it. I'm like, yeah. you know what? If I was at Walmart, I could have sprayed at least five or six people from 20 feet away, let alone six feet. But the mask did keep it within it within me unless they're on the side. So it still had a layer. And I started thinking about it. Well, it's obviously yeah. not perfect, but it's still prevented for, you know, a much more exposure, especially in regards to having those particles go in the air. So that's a good thing. And again, we'll talk about more about that later. But just to throw that in there is always a fun story to tell. But time of exposure. <laughs> that's another thing you mentioned. I think it's real important. I did hear some doctors early on talk about this, but with the media, you didn't really get a whole lot of this. Let's talk about time of exposure. How important is that? So when we're talking about time of exposure, we're talking about people that test positive for the virus. The health department calls them and they say, who are your close contacts? So close contacts aren't just people that you randomly say hi to in the street or you've walked past or you've even had any kind of like small interaction with. Close contact is 15 minutes or more and less than six feet apart. So that's the big thing. If you've talked to somebody for a minute and, and you're like two feet apart, the chances of you getting exposed to a lot of virus particles is really, really low. And you wouldn't be considered a close contact of that positive case. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. And what's the time in Ohio? It's greater than 15 minutes, correct? It's greater than 15 minutes. There are some states that are greater than 10 minutes, but health departments go greater than 15 minutes for other respiratory viruses too. So when we're talking about measles, because we've had measles outbreaks in Ohio as well, and it's the same thing. If you spent longer than 15 minutes with a person, there's a substantial chance that you've been infected by that person. But if, if it's less than 15 minutes, if it's like 10 minutes, there's a really good chance that you weren't exposed at all. So that brings us up to another thing in regard to time of exposure and amount of exposure is ventilation. Now, ventilation could play a big role in this, can it? Uh, yes, actually, it can. That's why the hospitals, when they get these individuals, because the virus spread by droplets, but it can break down and it can become airborne. Because the, when the virus particles leave on water droplets from the respiratory system, they break down and then they, become, then they can become airborne. So that's why hospitals actually put COVID patients in negative air pressure rooms because they end up like filtering 12 times a minute and pulling all that air out, circulating new air in. So ventilation is very, very important. The more that you can get your rooms ventilated where the old air gets pulled out and pushed out into the outside and the better off everybody inside is going to be. Right. And that's a big issue right now, probably with air conditioning offices, schools, factories, all these different places. Now, some factories may not have, they may be hot and use fans and open the garage doors and different things, but ventilation is a key role to keep people healthy. So I just want to put that out there for members is it's not something we think about too much. Usually you want to lock yourself in and, and not expose yourself, live in a bubble, so to speak, but <laughs> it's not the case. We want to open the windows up and maybe even sacrifice yeah. a little bit of the AC if we have to, 
even though that sucks, but to kind of throw it out, keep the air circulating, like you said, buy some kind of air purifiers and that kind of ventilation system. So we really got four keys here. I love it. Amount of exposure, second key, time of exposure, third is ventilation, and the fourth one is the big thing. We're going to do uh, some myth busting here. One of my favorite shows. We'll get to do it right now. <laughs> Mask. I know you're probably tired of answering these questions. So if you had one just quick pitch. Before we get into the nitty gritty details here, what would you tell everybody for mask? Anything that you can put in front of your mouth and nose to stop your droplets from coming out of your mouth will help reduce exposure to other people. And it will also end up helping reduce your exposure from other people. Awesome. Now, we're going to get a couple of the details that people are fighting over out there because we're peacemakers here. We want to help everyone (laughs) keep healthy. I've heard it. We talked about this before we started recording a couple instances that I was kind of surprised by, actually, because I know people were putting out face shields because there's different types of masks and different things. But someone told me they went to go to a retail store and so and so had a face shield, not a cloth mask, and they were turned away. And then I heard another story that, you know, a niece or nephew or someone went to work and they were wearing a face shield, not a cloth mask. And the employer said you can't come in unless you have a cloth mask, but they kind of went back and forth on it. And so. What's the lowdown? What what kind of mask we have? What's the lowdown on face shields? Are they good? Not good? Should we wear a cloth mask? Just big picture stuff on that too. So face shields, unfortunately, we haven't done a lot of research on force control and face shields. It actually just started coming up with this pandemic in April. That's when researchers started thinking about face shields to stop transmission. They do work. They do work really well. Face shields are the same kind of concept. Like when we go to Walmart and we have that pet plexiglass up or right. curvers or between boobs. It's the same thing. You basically just have a piece of plexiglass in front of your face. The reason that there may be pushback from employers about face shields is because they might not just be informed because all mandates that are coming from ODH and health departments right now say cloth face coverings. They don't necessarily include face shields. If there are um, employees that are going and they're wanting to wear face shields, they should just maybe talk to the health department and ask them because the health department more than likely will say, yes, face shields are accepted. There's actually instances where face shields should be used, such as if you're working with a hard of hearing population or people won't be able to hear you it because then people can read your mouth. Right. That's a big deal. Oh, my goodness. I had to yeah. learn how to walk again wearing a mask. <laughs> I went to go upstairs and downstairs, and I didn't realize how much a little piece of cloth of my around my nose would block my vision. And also, I was like, I can't hear anybody anymore. I didn't realize how much I was yeah. dependent on reading lips. It's such a, a big learning curve yeah. to have to actual like lean in and listen. <laughs> yeah. Let's get back to the very beginning of mask. We talked about this earlier. And again, I know it's probably always uncomfortable for everyone to talk about this because if you go on social media, it's like us for them, maskers, unmaskers. It's like the canteen on Star Wars out there. It's crazy. No one wants to yeah. go in without a weapon. You know what I mean? Because it's yeah, just, it's, I, yeah, it's crazy. I, yeah. And so back in the very beginning of this thing, which I hear a lot of people say is, listen, you came out, you told us not to wear the mask and said they're ineffective. And now you're trying to tell me they're effective. And Studying social psych like I do, there's something called an anchor point, right? Where once an anchor point or first impression is kind of made, it's really hard to change that decision. But you explained to me, and I thought it was a great explanation, there's a reason why for that. Can you go ahead and just kind of explain that to our listeners? If they're the ones struggling, like, hey, you told me this thing, you told me this, you don't even know what the heck you're talking about. What would you say? When we were hearing this from the CDC saying, like, masks aren't that important, we're not going to require people to wear masks. They are not going to make a big deal. It was because people were still thinking that the virus was spread respiratory, but also that there was a high incidence of contact transmission. And what we mean by contact is if somebody touches, I love this word, it's called a fomite. So a fomite is anything. It can be a table, it can be a doorknob, your phone, your computer, any kind of inanimate surface that you touch, the virus can stay on and then you can infect yourself. So what health officials were really concerned about at that time was that masks, because this was back when we weren't social distancing too, they were really afraid that masks, that people would put the masks on, not wear them properly, and not take them off, not wash their hands, and end up getting the virus, picking it up like off of a table through contact transmission. We now know that it's not really spread very much through contact. It's more just through the respiratory droplet. So they were more concerned with the contact transmission than 
and they were highly concerned that people would touch their masks right. and auto-inoculate themselves. So that means that they would touch their masks, there would be germs on their masks, and then they would touch their nose, touch their mouth, touch their eyes, and then get sick from it. So that's why health officials at the beginning were very hesitant to say we need everybody to wear masks because they were afraid of that auto-inoculation. That's good information. I really appreciate that because that really helps. I think, you know, I've wrestled with that. You said this thing, you said that. Someone should have had the PR guy run it through them before they came out and told everyone something wrong. But I think everyone was trying to find answers so many times. And like you said, we never dealt with the virus before. So we had to learn about it. So that's really good information. So let's talk about the subject of YouTubers. They're bringing up a lot of controversy, aren't they? So there's a lot of YouTube yeah. videos I've seen where they're taking like safety instruments to measure air quality, like, you know, CO2 or oxygen. And they're doing these little videos like, you know, OSHA says that it has to be the certain parts per million. Then they stick it on a mask and someone's breathing and then it measures three, four or five times what OSHA recommends. What's the science behind it? I mean, they're not real scientific experiments, but people are just doing it and they're going viral and and getting the word out there. Do the masks restrict your oxygen intake? Do they cause us to breathe our own breath in and breathe in too much carbon dioxide to cause us to get tired and fatigue and all these other things? What's the science behind that part of wearing a mask? So there's actually several things that I will talk about here. So they do not drop your oxygen level. There's all kinds of doctors, all kinds of nurses that wear masks all day long. And if you think that their breathing is impaired, then you probably shouldn't go get surgery or go to the hospital because their oxygen intake is messed up. But that's not the case. There's a lot of doctors that are putting information out where they wear a mask and you can see their pulse ox. So pulse ox is how much oxygen is in our blood at one time. It should be about 99%, and over the course of 15, 20 minutes, this doctor just keeps talking and talking and talking, and his pulse ox doesn't fall. So it does not actually affect the amount of oxygen in your blood system. As far as the carbon dioxide, any of the cloth masks, or especially the face shield, but any of the cloth masks, they're not sealed completely. It does fit against your skin, but there still is exchange, and Carbon dioxide molecules are way smaller than virus particles, and they get out. When we're talking about carbon dioxide, we're talking about like an atom, and millions and billions of atoms make up one virus particle. So there is an exchange, and the carbon dioxide does escape. I would also think that if they were doing these studies, that they should put them under the same exact environmental conditions and the same as the people that would be wearing the mask or OSHA if that makes any sense. Like, right. it, it really, if, if they're going to do this, it shouldn't be just, I'm walking around and I'm going to test this. It should be put under the same sure. experimental conditions that OSHA has run to. So some of the issue is we put the mask on, it's summertime, it's hot, we're breathing our own breath, it's uncomfortable, it gets stuffy in there, it gets a little maybe more humid or whatever we feel, we kind of feel stuffy. And, and sometimes we yes. get that. And maybe we get panicky as a result of our interpretation of that. And that's really what's kind of causing this. People feel shortness of breath and that kind of thing. It's not your actual oxygen levels going lower. So I just wanted to clarify and simplify yeah. that. So if, like you said, if we hooked you up to a machine, tested your oxygen, it is not getting lower in your bloodstream, which is what's most important. You're still getting oxygen to all your cells. It just feels uncomfortable because the heat and the different things and the blowback that we get under that mask. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Okay. And I guarantee you that people do get tired from wearing these masks. But it's not because of the oxygen level dropping. It's because it's stressful. It's uncomfortable. It's stressful. And when you're wearing them, you're out around people and maybe they're not making the same decisions as you. And like the world is more stressful now and that ends up wearing on. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's a stressful time anyways with work and media and just it's just everything just got and worse. Kids stress. And right. Kids at school. Yeah. I got to homeschool. I got all these different things to do. And so <laughs> motions are not running, you know, they're, they're running higher than normal. And they're already, we're already one of the most stressed out countries in the Western society. And, you know, so it's kind of a, uh, one of those things, how we handle that. It's a whole nother safety issue, but yes. Um, <laughs> so Duke university study come out. We just talked about this at the end of your webinar, just real briefly, because it was part of one of the questions that someone put in the chat. Now, I understand it's one study, so I want to put that disclaimer out there. It takes multiple studies for it to be technically scientific, right? The good old scientific method. Yeah. But this Duke <laughs> University came out with a study where they put different masks under pressure, so to speak, and kind of test them out and how effective they were with stopping the spread and, and this and that and who they affected and who they didn't affect. And they actually recommended surgical mask was the best 
was one of the best out there. Now, I know I'd agree that just put something on your face. <laughs> that that kind of solves the issue. But they did say there was a couple things that people should know. For example, N95 mask with a ventilator valve will protect the person from receiving it, but it will actually exhale. It doesn't it's still going to reduce a little bit, but there's still a little bit when a person exhales through that vent that could expose someone else. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, and we're not recommending that people go around wearing N95 masks with the valves on them at all. In fact, Disney World has outlawed masks with valves on them. Really? Because of this. Because of this. Yes. Yes. You have to have a, sur- a surgical mask or a uh, cloth covering with no valve on it. And it's because the valve does release particles, and if you're sick, they'll go out into the atmosphere. I've seen this a lot of cloth masks nerd- with, the, with the valve on them, too. Yeah. I've seen a lot of these custom-made nope, masks no. with the valve. Wow. They're not good for source control, which is what we're trying to do by getting everybody to wear masks, because some of the particles, some of the virus particles, do get out because of those valves. Right. Another inter- um, interesting thing they said was... The gator mask, which is, for those of you who don't know, I'm not real familiar with the term, but it's like a nylon kind of sleeve, real breathable athletes wear or people that may, you know, ride four-wheelers and ATVs, things to keep the dust out traditionally. But people are wearing these, you know, I have friends that coach in different things. A lot of coaches wear them because they're outside in the heat and it's a little more comfortable. But they actually said those, while they catch something, that it actually causes the particles to break up smaller, which will make them more susceptible to be floating in the air. So it, technically they said it can make it slightly worse. Now, I don't know if you've been able to follow up and look up any of that information out to comment on that or. So there's still a lot of people that are researching this because of that Duke study that came out. My guess is if I was to hazard a guess is because gators cover so much because they go from above your nose to like down to your shirt. Right. There's a lot of different fabric and all of that, all that fabric, the particles just keep breaking down, breaking down, breaking down. If you just have that cloth mask or the surgical mask where there's like a slight seal or where it uh, curves to your skin, all those particles are just going to get trapped in that mask. With the gator, they don't. And the smaller the particles get, the more they can suspend in the air and the longer they can hang out in the air because they become less dense than, than the air. And so that means that if people are walking through that area, that if there's smaller particles, there's a chance that they can hang out in the air longer, infecting more people. Right. So I think if you're a coach, you're outside in sports, it seems reasonable to wear one still if it's helping to be more breathable in the heat. Without, I mean, until more information yeah. comes out. But if you have like an oh, elderly yeah. parent you're taking care of, you may want to go with a more surgical cloth mask. That's, the only, reason, mask. Yes. that's yeah. the only reason why I put yeah. it out there, because if you're outside and you're coaching football or baseball and you're not real close to people, but you may get a little closer here or there because everyone's required, even coaches are required to wear a mask now. So maybe that'll be okay for that environment until more research comes out. Yeah. It is yeah. August 14th today, just so you know. So if it takes a couple of weeks for this <laughs> to come out, don't come back on us because another study came out. So I just right. wanted to clarify <laughs> that all masks are not created equal, but you should have something covering your face. Anything is better than nothing. Yes. Okay, and the last question in regards to masks is something I'm sure you get all the time. It's one of the number one email questions since COVID-19 come out and people say, hey, Mike, you know, it's 110 degrees in here in the summer and they're wearing masks and they, they say they can't breathe, you know, they're struggling with this and or they it fogs the glasses up and all this different stuff. And they're like, I'm afraid they're going to get hurt and OSHA's going to find me. But if they don't wear the mask, then the health department's going to find me. And I get the it's a, it's a real question. And then I have people that in our steering committee that work for a first aid company that go around and service the companies and they're like, man, people are getting overheated and exhausted and they think masks are part of that. What would you say in regards to wearing masks in a hot environment? What what would you tell those employers to tell the uh, employees? Well, first of all, I think that we've had a really hot summer, so it's not really helping anything at all. This summer, I think it's been right. uh, hotter than the last few summers. But definitely, if, if an employer is concerned about the health, safety, or welfare of any of their employees, they should check with their local health department because there are variances to wearing a mask, and it depends on your local health department. A lot of times we see variances in restaurants because they don't have the ventilation systems, especially in the back when they're standing over a grill and it becomes too hot, or there's a chance that a cloth mask could catch on fire. So they talk to the health department and they get a variance, and then the health department, if they receive calls about so-and-so is not wearing a mask, they, they have on record that that 
employer has a variant and they won't come and talk to you. Health departments aren't going to fine them necessarily. That's not their job. They will just come educate people. But definitely, if you're concerned about the health or welfare or safety, just check with your health department because there are ways that, like I said, the variances, they can get variances. They just need to show that the masks actually create more of a problem than a health. That's a really important piece of information right there because I didn't know you can get a variance. I'm sure there's a lot of people that are too afraid to call the health department because they're afraid they're going to get fined like OSHA coming in. But that's not how the health department works, like you said. I know Portage County Health Department, we work together in several projects and doing podcast interviews with them, events, expos. Just for the last seven years, I worked real close. We put publications out together. And whenever the conversation gets up about fines, even when it comes to restaurant and food safety, every single health department employee in Portage County that I talked to said, hey, Mike, I'm not trying to be the food police. I'm just coming in and making sure people are safe. I don't want to shut anyone down. Mm -hmm. If I have to shut someone down, I failed because my job is to help get them to where they need to be. And that's kind of almost like a consultant type role. Now, they do have that power to do that. But especially in Portage County, I can't speak for every health department. I'm hoping they're all the same way, but they don't, they, they said our policy is to come educate first and we want to work with everyone. We, we want to stop the spread. Our goal isn't to put anyone out of business. And so if you're a Porch County Safety Council member, and if you have these concerns and questions, reach out to the Porch County Health Department. They're not going to target you. They're not going to come do a surprise inspection, especially if you're reaching out and ask them these type of questions. They know you're trying to do whatever you can do. Yes. They're going to be very happy that the employer approached them and said, Hey, I got this issue. And I want to know, like, what I can do to help. I'm trying to do what I can. I'm trying to follow all the health mandates, but it's just really hard because of this. They're going to be so excited that the employer approached them and they're trying to solve it instead of somebody from the community calling and complaining. It's just a lot better if the employers go and they talk to the health department. They're very receptive. They just want to help and they want to keep everybody as safe as possible. Dr. Kristen, I appreciate you so much for coming on here and answer real tough questions that you're probably tired (laughs) of answering that you probably hear all the time or you see on social media and you're like, oh, please stop. You're making my job worse. Thank you for coming on and addressing these issues because I I think we have four keys here. You know, number one, the, the amount of exposure. If we limit the amount of exposure, we're going to stop the spread to the time of exposure. And three, ventilation. The more ventilation we have, the the better we're going to stop the spread. And four, mask. And there's a lot more details that people could listen to. So thanks for giving us those four keys and, and being brave enough just to answer those questions. So hopefully I don't get yeah. too many comments on our social media posts about this. I'll just delete them. You hear me? I, I don't have a policy to keep me. I don't have to keep them. So I'll just delete all the bad comments. Okay. Or yeah. I'll send them that's, to you. Can good. I email that's them good. to you? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if anyone, I might just delete them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> if anyone has any questions, can they reach out to you at all at the state and get more information? Yeah. yeah. If they have any questions, all the information that I get is from CDC and ODH. I also do other research polls from studies, scientific journals. But if they need any information or they need help with resources or they need anything, uh, they can email me. Emailing me is usually the easiest way to get a hold of me. So I'm going to go ahead and put a link to our video for the webinar that you did. We made it public out there. I'll put a link in the show notes. So if you're listening to this, you can watch her full presentation. That was from August 13th, 2020 had great reviews on it. I learned a lot of new things actually that some of those things we talked about today. So also we'll, we'll do a full podcast from your presentation and Q and a from that event. In addition to this, because honestly, I know everyone's tired of hearing about COVID, but there's just small details that come out that go a long way. And I think we talked about a lot of those right here, but you go more in depth in some of those things, especially in regards to contact tracing. You spend a lot of time in that. And I think people should go and watch that video and really take in all the information as well as what we talked about here. So again, thank you, Dr. Kristen. And uh, we hope to get you back again sometime. I hear you do a really good topic on stress management. So I'm, yeah, I'm keeping that, that in the radar. After talking about COVID, <laughs> yeah, so talk about COVID, and then I do stress management. You're yeah. kind of like the <laughs> medical handy woman right now, so you can do you can do all the yeah, important things right now. So. So, Dr. Kristen, thank you again for coming out. I really appreciate it. I can't wait to have you back at the Safety Council doing another webinar and another podcast for us as well. Yes, that sounds excellent. Anytime. Thanks for everyone for listening and everyone out there. Be safe.
Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed today's podcast. For more episodes, check us out on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, Podbeam, or Stitcher. To get new episodes sent directly to your phone or smart device, be sure to subscribe. To learn more about how your company can earn up to a 4% Ohio BWC premium rebate by becoming an active member of the Portage County Safety Council, please visit our website at www.portagecountysafetycouncil.wordpress.com. The preceding information is for entertainment purposes only. Views expressed may not reflect the views of any affiliated or sponsoring individuals or organizations. Listeners should carefully weigh information provided and seek advice from an appropriate professional before implementing. Listener discretion is advised.